Okay, it's 5.06 again, so we'll go ahead and get started here. <clears throat> uh, so, like I said, the blower, motor, and housing, kind of go back to that again. Um, be sure that that's clean. Your wheel's clean, your housing's clean. Um, with smartphones, you can take good pictures of those and show show the customer what's in those wheels. If it's nasty, I mean, they don't want to breathe that. Um, it's an easy sell for a cleaning uh, or even a new wheel if it's that bad. Um, so it's super important to pay attention to that. Um, actually, let me get back on the slideshow here. There we go. Uh, as you're dealing with heat pumps, you're going to deal with reversing valves. Um, they can be troublesome uh, with on both service calls and uh, tune-ups. Um, but kind of one way to, uh, I found the easiest way to troubleshoot these. Sometimes there's hard to get to, that's, I know that. Um, but think about you have four ports. So this is coming off your compressor here. Then you have B, C, and D. So depending on which way the slide is in this picture, you can see the slide. Depending on where the slide's going to, it's gonna direct your discharge pressure to either C or D. So if you're checking A, ideally you wanna be a few inches away as far as you can get within reason, away from the actual valve itself. So you get uh, two or three, four inches away from the valve on A. If you come up here to check C, they should be very similar um, within a couple degrees. So you should have A and C should be very similar. B and D should be very similar. If by chance this slide gets stuck somewhere in the middle, you're gonna cause some bleed through. So A will be a very distinctive hot temperature and then uh, D, B and C will all be uh, three distinctive temperatures. Um, so you're looking for somewhere between eight to 12 degrees difference on those. So in this case here, if you're checking B and C, they should be wildly different. Um, D and B should be very similar, but if you check D to B and it's above eight to 12 degrees difference, you're probably bleeding through this slide here. And if you take a, like a neodymium magnet and place it on the valve body itself, you can see the slide is a very small section there. It doesn't slide all the way back and forth. It's right here in the middle. Uh, if you put a magnet on there, you can actually see it slide back and forth to see if it's truly if it's truly sliding. So if you're engaging in heating, or depending on whether, what brand you're doing, uh, so if you're engaging it and disengaging your reversing valve, uh, you should see a small fluctuation in your magnet. And you'll also be able to tell with this, uh, if you think your reversing valve is sticking, um, you'll end up with a higher than expected, higher than normal suction pressure, and then a lower, uh, much lower uh, than expected discharge pressure. That's gonna kind of point you towards the reversing valve. Um, so that could be, it could be that it's stuck in here. I've seen them before. We've cut them open to where these were so stuck and corroded. Um, we had to take a screwdriver and more or less knock it loose. So it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just stuck, it was like fused together. So those can be tricky. Um, a lot of the solenoids uh, are removable, some of them are not. Um, most, a lot of brands I see are removable if need be. And as you get into evaporator coils, what they're showing here is a ream coil. So whether it's a ream, uh, a Sure Comfort, Weather, Weather King, uh, train American Standard, whatever it is, you're gonna have some, fo some form of uh, evaporator coil, whether it be an A or an N coil, um, should be inspected. 
and verified to be clean to ensure proper reparation. Um, like I say, I checked coils on every single service call I ran, every single tune-up. Um, invariably, if I missed one, that was the one that came back to bite me. Um, whether it takes just a couple minutes to check it, it's well worth to see if it's dirty. If it is dirty, it's not going to heat properly or it's not going to cool properly as well. And if you are doing a tune-up and you miss a coil, um, chances are you'll be, you know, you'll be back there cleaning it for free. Because I had that happen to me more than a few times where my text went out there, uh, didn't. Well, they didn't bother to check the indoor coil or the outdoor coil very well. Um, then I was the one out there on a Friday night or a weekend cleaning it. So um, always make sure they're clean. Uh, make sure they're installed on the supply side of the gas furnaces. Uh, if you can install them on the return side, and they will work. Um, but the moisture from the coil itself will uh, degrade your heat exchanger over time. So that's why you, you prefer to put it on the supply side. Uh, once again, uh, ensure the drain lines are clear and free flowing. Um, can't, can't stress that enough. Um, one uh, drain line backup that leads to a insurance claim uh, is devastating, let alone get two or three of them. And actually just remember, um, Drain lines don't clog up within a week or two if they're cleaned out. So always make sure that you, like I say, I use hot water to flush mine out, nitrogen, whatever you do. But even on service calls, if I'm running an air conditioner, you know, I'm not leaving until I see water coming out of that drain. You know, so I, so I can verify that, hey, I see the water's flowing, drain's clear, we know we're in business. You know, it just takes a couple extra minutes to do these things. Um, but a couple extra minutes prevents callbacks. Because a callback on a busy day may lose you a uh, a big service call. I mean, a, a wasted callback on a busy day could lose you an equipment sale. So not to mention the fact you're paying for, for labor twice, uh, gas and everything else. Condenser coils. Uh, like I said, I, I inspect every coil on every single job I do. Um, some of the Bryant and Carrier models, they they don't look dirty, but they are dirty. Um, you can, if you touch them or, you know, you can tell they're dirty, look at the pressures. Um, but what I would always do, because uh, I would take a dollar bill or pick up a blade of grass if you have a clean coil and you toss a dollar bill or a blade of grass, it should suck it right to that, to the coil. Because, you know, it's pulling the air from the outside, pushing it up. If I can take a, a blade of grass and throw it at the unit and it falls, you know, my coil is dirty. Whether it looks dirty or not, it is dirty. Um, so when I, when I told customers that they needed a coil cleaning, explained it to them, showed them the pressures. You know, I would also do the blade of grass trick or even a dollar bill. You know, once I was done, I would repeat that process and show them, say, hey, your pressures have dropped, you know, 80 PSI or whatever it is. And then I would take a, the same blade of grass, toss it there or a dollar bill and it would suck it right to the coil. So they know they got their money's worth. Uh, symptoms of a dirty or restricted coil. Um, if you just touch the coil, it's gonna be hot. You know, your liquid line is going to be extremely hot, much hotter than it should be. Uh, also, your head pressure on your gauges, your discharge pressure will be, can be ridiculously high. Um, I've cleaned coils before and dropped them almost 100, 125 PSI before. You know, just cleaning the coil, bam, the unit works perfectly again. And that's not uncommon. So here you have just a couple examples. Um, the proper way to clean the coil, uh, I mean, there's any number of ways to clean it. I myself prefer to use a, uh, a coil gun, the coil blaster gun. They, they sell them here. They sell them other, other uh, places as well. You know, I put my coil cleaner in there, and then I would foam the coil, let it sit there, and then flush it out. Um, 
can't do that necessarily on micro channels, but uh, most uh, copper and aluminum coils you can. Um, foam your coil out. It's nice and clean, looks good. Um, and it's basically back to factory specs. Um, do be careful if you use cleaner, not to use a heavy cleaner. Um, if you use like a, uh, a non-diluted version of the purple uh, or the pink, um, you will take the paint off the cabinets. You'll take the paint off the coil. You'll also kill any vegetation uh, next to the air conditioner. So be, you know, be careful with that as well. And as we get into the metering devices here, um, not so much now, but you know, used to when my techs called me and they would ask me, start giving me scenarios. First thing I wanted to ask them was, okay, what kind of metering device do you have? Do you have a piston or TXV? Cause that changes the direction of what you're looking for. Um, if they told me they didn't know, well, go find out, give me a call back and, then we can address the we can address the problem once we know what your metering device is. Um, if you try to charge a, a, a TXV and it's a, like a piston, if it's a piston, and you try to charge it uh, opposite, um, you will end up with some very very erratic pressures. Um, it may look good for a second, but as it balances and stabilizes, it will change. Uh, so figure out what kind of metering device that you have. Um, as you can see here in this picture, he's cleaning out the, the piston. Uh, if you get any kind of debris in that piston, it will cause your head pressure to skyrocket, in some cases, almost immediately. So our metering devices here, pistons, uh, they're charged by superheat, um, specifically. Um, there's different charts out there. Uh, superheat charts that allow you to dial it in based on the the outdoor temperature indoor wet bulb uh, you plot your temperatures and it will give you your your specific required superheat um, that's the best way to do that if you're dealing with a piston some guys just use a regular you know basic uh, you know eight to 18 degrees and you'll be close, but you could also be overcharged. Uh, what we see predominantly today and for the last number of years is TXB style. Uh, they are charged specifically by subcooling. Um, so depending on the manufacturer, I know Train American Standard, they will put a specific subcooling, or they did when I was a dealer for them, uh, specific required subcooling. Uh, Carrier and Bryant, they'll put a specific required subcooling. Uh, Ream, Sure Comfort, and Weather King, uh, they will give you a charging chart inside the door that will convert over to some, it'll give you some gross pressures and then give you a required subcooling. And that's the proper way to charge a TXB is by either what's on the data plate or charging chart. And what we're seeing more and more on the inverter units uh, are the EEVs, the electronic expansion valves. Uh, they are also charged by subcooling, um, but they use a couple other things as well. Uh, they'll use some transducers and thermistors uh, to help make those calculations to dial in that subcooling. And a uh, TXV, its main job, its only job really is to uh, maintain the desired superheat. So if you set your cup cool subcooling, it will it will maintain a desired superheat. Uh, possible issues with piston styles. Um, uh, you get clog you get junk in your system. It'll clog up your piston. Um, that's what you see predominantly. Um, occasionally you'll come across what somebody that's put an undersized piston or oversized piston in there, that can be an issue. Uh, TXV issues, I mean, we, this is kind of a serious issue. Um, when I was a dealer for one brand, every time I did a startup, um, I mean, I'd cross my fingers and I would actually do the brazing 
and even then I would still cross my fingers and hope that it didn't, you know, stick. That's how you know bad it was. Um, then I even carried extra TXBs on the off chance that uh, it stuck. I would change it out, and you know, the customer wouldn't have any problems. Um, how do you test the TXB operation and response? Um, it's fairly simple, especially with Ream Sure Comfort. Um, they put the bulbs on the outside. Uh, other brands put them on the inside, um, but it's important to verify the bulb's position, preferably on 10 and two on a horizontal, that would be optimal, and then also insulate it. If you put the bulb in the wrong position, that's gonna cause you some erratic operation. Also, if it's not insulated, it will also cause you erratic operation. Uh, the easiest way to what I call exercise it um, is warm water or your hand. You know, dip that bulb into warm water or you can hold that hold the bulb in your hand. Um, that should open the valve. And it should, especially if you put it in warm hot warm water or hot water, it should open it pretty pretty dramatically. Um, there again, you can do it the opposite way. If you use ice water on a sensing bulb, you can actually close the valve. So if you dip it in ice water, it should practically close the valve. And that should be quite uh, dramatic on both sides, if it's hot water or cold water. So if it does not respond when you use hot water, for instance, or cold water, um, then you've got, you more than likely have a defective sensing bulb. Um, so at that point, you change out the TXB. Um, another thing we run into is, this kind of gets into installation practices and service practices. Um, a lot of these TXVs have screens in them. If you get junk in here, you know, this is your liquid line, so if you get some junk in here, it's going right into this TXV. And it will, it will, in many cases, simulate uh, a defective TXV. So if you clog up a screen that's on the inlet here, uh, it's going to simulate getting a uh, a bad TXB because you can't get refrigerant through there. That's very common. So for the most part, uh, you can exercise them hot or cold, um, verify your screen if, if there's a screen in there. Um, and when you're brazing, be sure to remove your bulb as you're brazing. And don't get this body too hot. You can see here you got two braze connections. You'd want to, uh, well, the way I would do this here is I would wrap this bulb right here all the way through with a wet, cool rag, and then I would use cool gel here and here. So if you're brazing, you don't get any kind of or very minimal heat transfer to the valve body itself. That will save you a lot of trouble, trouble, trouble as well. As you get into the EVs, this, this is more specifically for uh, inverter units. You see them on uh, Ream. Uh, they're uh, inverter units, uh, Mitsubishi, any kind of mini split, they all use the EVs. Um, so basically you have a couple parts to an EV. You have your, your motor, which is the top piece here, which has the wires. It's usually like a black rubber, um, you know, cap basically. And this this will come on and off because this bottom piece here, this brass piece here, 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 that's your valve body. So you got your motor, it sits snugly all the way down onto your valve body and then it's secure. Then the, the motor pulses here and that will actually drive this needle up and down. So I haven't had very many, if maybe one or two uh, valve bodies, EV bodies themselves go bad. Um, it's usually the motor or it's the controller. So the controller would be the board or whatever is uh, receiving and interpreting the uh, signals. So like I say, usually it's not in the body itself. It's usually in the motor and you can usually hear that. It'll, it'll click. When you power it up, it'll click. I mean, like tick, 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 tick. It'll do that. It'll open and close. Uh, if you don't hear that, then chances are you may have a uh, either a bad motor or a bad 
controller. And the only way really to troubleshoot these motors themselves, uh, you, can, you can actually ohm out the wires. Uh, for all the different EEVs, there's an ohm chart, and that's really the, the best way to, to check those. So when you're charging an AC or heat pump, step number one, make sure you know what type of metering device you're using. Uh, with Ream, ensure comfort specifically. Uh, you want to you want to know what your orientation is. Is it upflow, downflow, horizontal, or, or in this case, horizontal right or left? That can make the difference of how you charge it. Uh, also, you want to follow your manufacturer's charging charts. Uh, or required subcooling. If there's a charging chart in the door, follow that. Uh, if it's on the net data plate, follow that. Um, big one is to always allow at least, for the TXV especially, um, allow 25 to 30 minutes to stabilize. Really anything before 15, it's still, it's still ramp, ramping up and stabilizing. So allow time to stabilize and then verify your temperature rise. So if you do have to make any adjustments, you know, once you get your subcooling or superheat dialed in, you should be able to go right into your indoor section and verify the temperature rise. You know, and if you have it dialed in on your gauges, your temperature rise should reflect that as well. Now, one thing that gets me, it doesn't get me anymore because I check it, but it'll get people every year is if you have a heat pump with electric furnace, your refrigerant pressures may be perfect. And it may give you the impression that it's working beautifully. And you may go in and do a temperature rise and it is way off. So in a case like that, um, I got burned once like that and that's why I never let it happen again. Um, check your temperature rise. If it, if it, say if you've got like a 10 degree split, your refrigerant pressures look perfect. Uh, your return temperature seems good, so you're not sucking in excessively hot air from somewhere. You're like, well, why is my temperature rise not better? If that's the case, go in and check your uh, auxiliary limits, not auxiliary elements, check your heating elements. You may have a heating element that's stuck on that's providing uh, a certain number of kilowatts of heat, you know, when you're trying to cool. So. That gets guys every year, and I say it burned me one time. Now you may get to customers' houses uh, that complain about humidification. Um, a lot of that's pretty legitimate. Um, so as you're addressing humidity issues, um, a big one is properly sized equipment. Um, it's not uncommon in certain areas to see equipment massively oversized. Um, if it's massively oversized, it will not dehumidify. Um, also, the charge. If it's not charged properly, it will not dehumidify. And then also airflow. Um, if you have too much airflow, it will not dehumidify. So a lot of times with uh, certain systems, um, if it's massive, if it's oversized, Sometimes you can accommodate a little bit of manipulation of the airflow and the charge. So it actually starts pulling some humidity out. So if customers complains of dehumidification, kind of dig into equipment size, uh, charge, and then airflow reduction, if that's an option. In some cases it's not, but concentrate on those three things for humidity issues. Now I want to cover some brazing um, and pressure testing while we're here. Um, for years ago, we didn't we didn't purge with nitrogen. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt. You know. I have I have one question. Do you mind if I ask about what's yeah. relative humidity uh, percentage are we supposed to be sitting out here in Colorado? Because I'm from the south, and uh, it was a little bit different out there than it is out here. Um, honestly. Colorado is a different animal. I'm from Indianapolis, so I can't say for sure. I can't speak specifically for Colorado, unfortunately. Um, I know there. I know it's totally different out there. I don't want. Uh, I don't want to point you in the wrong wrong direction there. 
but if you uh if you send me an email uh i left my email in the uh uh chat function there um send me an email with your information and i'll find out specifically for you what you guys should be shooting for yes sir i appreciate your time okay thank you okay so back to brazing um Purging with nitrogen is, is exceptionally important. Um, it reduces contaminants and debris in the system. It may not sound like much, um, but it's huge. So if you're going out, putting a new system in, we deal with it every single day. Um, systems that maybe are not put in quite like they should be. Um, and there's guaranteed issues to come after that. So um, this is an excellent, um, or some version of this, whether it's Victor uh, or some other brand, um, this particular regulator, because it will actually provide a pressure test up to 600 PSI. Not this one will, but it's bad, this one doesn't. But one just like it does, sorry. Um, but the one I'm ref referring to, will have a pressure test up to s up over 600 PSI. Um, Mitsubishi and most and a lot of ductless units they require a 600 psi uh, pressure test so that's why getting the proper regulator is important um, also the regulators similar to this one uh, they'll have the purge feature um, and braze feature as well so you can just set it to braze and it will slightly purge uh, nitrogen through the system for you so that's important so Victor and Harris um, the two models, uh, well, that I've seen and, and used, uh, they're perfect. Um, and it's nice to have that 600 PSI whenever you're dealing with Mitsubishi um, leak testing. So some brazing best practices, like I say, uh, nitrogen purge, do not overheat components. Um, that's pivotal. Um, I've seen valves come back uh, not too long ago where they were, I mean, blackened um, and they were leaking. Brand new units being installed and they were just toasted. Um, so you can easily toast service valves, TXVs, and reversing valves. Um, any kind of braze work you're doing, um, wet wrap and use cool gel or some type of um, heat. Uh, you know, they've got different things now. Um, but I used to always use cool gel, but wrap them up with cool rag, heat gel them uh, to protect any kind of valve work, anything sensitive. Um, don't overheat those components. And then when you're getting to your vacuum, um, I got into the, to the practice um, many years ago. Of course, like I say, it was my company, so, um, Time is money and, you know, free work doesn't exactly, you know, put money in the bank. Uh, so I got to the habit of if I was doing an installation um, or even a service call, you know, I'm, I'm doing the same process every time. Um, doing, a, doing a complete nit nitrogen uh, leak check and then doing a complete uh, triple evacuation. So when I know when I leave, I know there's no leaks and I know that system's clean and dry and good to go. So when I leave, you know, there will not be any issues until, unless something else breaks. Um, what's huge is on the vacuum pumps, change them more than once a summer. I say that as a joke, but I, I mean, I've known guys that were like that before. Uh, change the vacuum pump on a regular basis. Um, Vacuum pump oil is cheap. Um, if you keep fresh oil in here, especially after contaminated systems, uh, fresh oil in your pump, uh, it cuts your vacuum time down tremendously. If you if you keep dirty dirty uh, oil in there, you're not gonna you'll never get the vacuum you should, and it'll take you ten times as long to even get close. Uh, so that so make sure you change your pump oil on a regular basis. I uh, know installers are sometimes changing it three times a week, depending on what they're working with. And then also doing a triple evacuation. Um, I was taught this, I mean, years and years ago in school. Um, 
and probably well, I'd say 12 to maybe 15 years ago, I started doing it on every every compressor, every leak repair, everything I did, I would do the triple evac. Because if I kept a good pump, clean oil, you know, it didn't take me long to do it. Uh, for those who don't know what a triple evacuation is, um, what it's designed to do is when you set up your vacuum, you'll pull your initial vacuum using a micron gauge uh, to 4,000 microns, 5,000 microns. Uh, then you'll you'll stop it. You'll break it with nitrogen. Then you'll turn your vacuum back on again. You're going to suck it back down to 1,500 microns and break it again with nitrogen. So you've drawn two vacuums and purged with nitrogen. The third vacuum, you're going to pull down below 500 microns. Once it gets below 500, turn it off, verify the vacuum holds. And if you can do, if you do that, you, you can be rest assured that it's leak free and it's clean and dry. Um, with a good pump and the proper gauges uh, and proper hoses, I can pull a vacuum down below 500 in, you know, minutes sometimes. But the point, of, the point of the triple vacuum is you can draw the uh, vacuum so deep so quickly, you still have moisture in the system. You know, even though you have a low vacuum because you've basically frozen it. Uh, so the theory behind breaking the nitrogen, um, you're flushing any kind of moisture, any kind of uh, contaminants that are in there. So once you get that final vacuum, it is clean, it is dry, and it is tight. And if you do that, your callbacks become almost nil related to leak checking or any kind of uh, non condensables. And that's uh, inability to. Is that after you replace the filter dryer? Yes. Yep. Yep. That's your. So once you're getting ready to, or once you get it back up and you start your pressure test, you're going to follow your pressure test with the vacuum, with the triple evacuation. Got it. Uh, inability to achieve vacuum indicates a leak. So if you're using a micron gauge, which you should be, uh, if your micron gauge keeps climbing, 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 uh, it indicates a leak. That may necessarily mean it's on a uh, brace fitting or something like that. It can be a Teflon seal. Uh, it can be the seals on your hoses. It can be any number of things. Um, but if you do have a vacuum that keeps on rising, you know, it's indicating there's a leak somewhere. Um, so you want to address that to make sure that it's clean and dry. The clean dry system will last a long time uh, and reduce any kind of internal damage. Uh, actually, I'm big on triple evacs. Um, any manufacturer will tell you triple evacuation is the way to go. Um, Climate Master has a very specific way they want theirs done. Uh, same with Mitsubishi, so other manufacturers as well. Um, how long does it take to perform a triple evacuation? Not that long, actually. Um, especially if you have new lines uh, and you don't have any kind of contaminants in the system, doesn't take long at all. If you're doing a service job, it may add an extra 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, 15 to 20 minutes a day versus a callback, you know, down the road is well worth it. Uh, it is important uh, every time the system is open to the atmosphere that you replace the filter dryer, uh, do a leak check, uh, and do a triple evac. Uh, clean and dry systems ensure it's free of moisture and non-condensables. That's going to make sure you're, you're not going to get any kind of acid buildup in your compressor or in, inside the system. Reduces callbacks and breaks that, breakdowns. Um, I recommend, and most, most places, most companies do recommend a standalone micron gauge. Uh, without, definitely without a micron gauge, you can't accurate, accurately vacuum a system. All you can tell is that you're in a negative if you're just using regular manifold gauges. Um, with the field piece, I've got a couple sets of the S-Mans. They've got built-in micron gauges. I mean, it's it, it works. I won't say that it was, don't work, um, but I prefer, and most most manufacturers recommend a standalone vacuum gauge. That's more accurate, um, so you know exactly what you have, 
and what you're what you're dealing with. This this particular JB, you can set them. You can set what you want the vacuum to be at. Once it reaches that vacuum, it's going to sound an alarm. So you can come over there and take it off. Is there is there a particular reason why they don't trust the uh, the digital gauges? Well, if you've ever if you ever use one, a standalone versus the uh, uh, the field piece, for instance, um, they are they are different. You know what you see on the two gauges, they are different. Now, that's they were. I've just always heard that you know they're not quite as accurate, and I've ran them both at the same time, and they are usually a little bit different. So okay. using the standalone using the standalone micron gauges, that's what it's designed for. You know, just uh, a lot of guys use it on the gauges. If you use that, that's better than nothing. <laughs> so, but there's multiple, uh, if you prefer to have one, uh, there's multiple uh, digital micron gauges out there. So, okay. Had the video off there. Okay, well, um, covered quite a bit there um if you does anybody have any questions here okay if you do have any questions you want to contact me later right here in the chat um use this bottom phone number here um that's my work cell phone uh here's my direct email any questions if you want to ask and uh, the one gentleman asked about the humidity in colorado um if you want to send me your name, send me your information here to this email, um, I'll dig in and find specifics. Um, I've never really been to Colorado, so I don't want to uh, give you wrong information. So uh, if there's no questions, um, I do appreciate you taking the time out today, and I'm happy that you attended. And feel free to call me uh, or email me anytime. I'm happy to help you. So you all have a good day. Thank you.